Okay, the other side of the mechanics story is the Irish version, which is Hamilton's work. So that's what we're going to uh, work with today. And um, this is still a review section, and that's probably not so appropriate given that many mechanics classes at the undergraduate level will not even get to the Hamiltonian. So that, that can be embarrassing. But in any case, we are getting to it right now in the review section. And part of this lecture is going to be showing you that there are some disadvantages for doing uh, Hamilton uh, mechanics. But uh, then we turn it around in the second half and show what are the advantages of it. And the advantages eventually after uh, a couple more lectures are, are quite obvious. And uh, we'll see that in, in, for many purposes uh, it, it wins. But uh, it's true in most of theoretical physics that there is no perfect Swiss Army knife for any of our disciplines. And um, that's why I'm giving you so many different ways to look at, the, at things so that you get some feeling for how to build your own particular Swiss Army knife for every problem. And uh, that uh, I, th I think is uh, at least the way I've been successful in my uh, endeavors. In any case, uh, just to remind you that the Hamiltonian is the thing that's going to be a, a function of momentum, but not on uh, velocity. So uh, look at the second slide here right on this screen. Uh, this is the from page 25 of the lecture 8, where we were doing the geometry that gave our, uh, us the first uh, Lagrange equation. And in the last lecture, we got the second one that involved uh, the influence of an outside force or a potential. If you did it with a potential, it's a very, a very elegant form, which we're going to use uh, to get the Hamiltonian form. That's the doorway we're going to take today. So uh, that's important. And then, of course, the geometry of, of these objects is important. So uh, once again, I'll try to keep these uh, two screens uh, more or less in sync. And, uh, We'll be looking at uh, the uh, Hamilton's way of doing it, which is not this. Uh, he is not interested in using a contravariant velocity as the independent kinetic variable. He wants to use momentum. The momentum is a covariant quantity. So uh, we'll be using the contravariant uh, metric in order to make an invariant Hamiltonian. So we'll be using a G super MN we only touched on a little bit in the uh, lecture on Tuesday, the pre preceding lecture. So that, uh, along with some other things that are different, um, gave us all of this using the Lagrangian and uh, gave us the hurricane uh, mechanics, more or less. This is a, a Coriolis equation, but there are all of the other equations were uh, derived uh, just as easily. So. Uh, this is the thing that we uh, have to deal with now. Instead of covariant uh, metric, a contravariant metric, and instead of a contravariant independent uh, kinetic variable, we're going to be using momentum, which is P lower M, and that's covariant uh, by the proper terminology that's used uh, for doing generalized cor uh, curvilinear coordinates. Now, um, we'll uh, be deriving Hamilton's equations directly from Lagrange's uh, equations. So that's the, the uh, modus operandi uh, here. Starting uh, from uh, our uh, knowledge that the, elect the uh, uh, Lagrangian is an explicit function of velocity, but perhaps also time. That's a ticklish issue. Are you really going to be turning knobs in the middle of the flight of the whatever orbiting object you're looking at, uh, if you are, then that's another variable that you have to worry about. So uh, we will worry about it whenever it's necessary to worry about it, and that's right now. So the uh, idea of not just having velocity, but also the coordinates, 
uh, as functions uh, here. With the super ball, we didn't have uh, uh, a Lagrangian that was a function of where the balls were. Now we do. Now we're dealing with that. Uh, we're dealing with uh, real orbits. So um, this time part uh, here uh, is 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 really necessary, and uh, you can uh, <clears throat> easily. Uh, when you're, if it really is a function of time, you need this, this extra term here, partial L with respect to T, uh, then times one. Uh, each of these, this is just a chain rule over all of the variables that you uh, have decided that this function uh, should uh, uh, have. Now, here we're working with the time derivative of the Lagrangian, the total time derivative of the Lagrangian. If it's not an explicit function of time, then all of its changes are due to the variables, coordinates, or velocities changing. But if you've got uh, somebody tinkering with this thing, you've got a field in there that you're turning the knobs on, you definitely need to uh, add that. So I don't know how to uh, make a cartoon out of this, but this is the best I can come up with. And that's a, a, a mad scientist. Uh, I guess it's B. And uh, here he's trying to change the class size. I don't know where I got this thing, but it's kind of cute. You know, the class is either being made larger or smaller at the output of the, the class size changer. But uh, it's the uh, whole idea of turning the knob on something is, uh, you know, it's part of engineering mechanics, because that's what engineers uh, like to do, build something, run it, and then uh, mess it up while it's running. In any case, uh, our Lagrange equations they're very elegant the way we uh, showed them. Uh, here is the uh, second uh, Lagrange equation in which uh, we're admitting that uh, P dot is not zero. That is, we're admitting that the momentum wasn't conserved. And if it isn't conserved, then you need to know what the partial derivative of L with respect to the coordinate uh, M, uh, component M, uh, is. This is the equation, the first Lagrange equation that we derive by geometry, okay? So we're gonna put that in, uh, put these, uh, these uh, variables in uh, to this, uh, this uh, uh, partial derivative here uh, with respect to the coordinate. That means I'm gonna stick in a P dot M here and then using the partial derivative of L with respect to Q dot, well that is P without a dot, so that, that goes uh, there. And pretty soon, uh, with this uh, a technique, uh, we do get an equation that is Hamilton's equation. This is the whole idea. We also get the Poincaré relationship, which we were, was, if, if, if uh, there ever is a derivation that was sort of uh, squishy, uh, iffy, uh, that was it. It was the Poincaré relation, where we had to decide whether we were going to use P dot V, which had numerically correct values for uh, uh, either one of the functions if you're given the right coefficient. Here we settle that issue. Now what we're going to do is use the product rule. Let me get this on the uh, other uh, screen here. We're going to use the product rule and the uh, idea is once you've done that, uh, you get an equation here uh, where you have the partial derivative of L with respect to T here, the total derivative uh, due to every, everything's motion uh, dl dt uh, right here. We're just going to uh, switch those. And that pretty much gives you um, Hamilton's, uh, well it gives you the Hamiltonian is what it does. It gives you a Hamiltonian function in a form which will eventually be just a function of momentum and coordinates. We're not mentioning the coordinates uh, uh, in, in that particular thing. It's just like what we had before when we first tackled this. So th this is what you're ending up with here, this product of P and that's momentum and Q dot, that's velocity. That's an action. But so is L. These are in uh, what we will see later, action units. The whole idea of action is so important for uh, defining phase in the quantum uh, stuff so we're trying to play on that boundary uh, uh, throughout the rest of this review and then later on in Unit 8. 
Okay, so um, what we have here is DDT of something. That something is the Hamiltonian. <coughs> We're talking about the total time derivative of a Hamiltonian is the partial derivative with a minus sign of the Lagrangian. <coughs> you got to uh, admit that that's some pretty screwy calculus right there. <coughs> this is where you really have to think of what do you mean by a total derivative? What do you mean by a partial? Okay, so uh, that that's a key uh, sort of venture here. Now this this right here is called the Legendre transformation. It's an old that's our it's old for us now. We've seen it a couple of times, and we argued about it a little bit, but. Um, the uh, idea also is that that's Poincaré's Poincaré's relation. You can either put the H and the L in this order, or flip them. It's still correct, right? So and that's the one at the top of the wall over there. Is H equal P Q dot minus L? This is the uh, relationship that Poincaré would have uh, uh, used perhaps more often than the other one. We're going to play the other one a lot before we're done uh, with this re the whole review section. Okay, now, remember our way of looking at this is to say the partial of L with respect to P and has no explicit dependence on momentum is identically zero. Three bar uh, equality sign there. And uh, that uh, is uh, definitely uh, part of this game here. And the same arguments that we use to say that the Hamiltonian is not an explicit function of velocity, so its partial derivative is identically zero as well. Now that argument was an optimization argument. Remember, we pushed secants out, out, out until they became tangent. That was the optimum value for that uh, uh, sloping line, had a particular slope. So uh, remember that sort of stuff when you're uh, really getting down to making this uh, have sense. So uh, this partial derivative of h with respect to p, that's this partial derivative of this thing, uh, definitely gives you something right here, the partial derivative of pm with respect to pm, and that's 1. So this is giving us the partial derivative of h with respect to pm is equal to 1 times q dot, and then this thing just contributes nothing. So that's one of our uh, our equations. That is uh, for Hamilton. That's Hamilton's first equation. Okay? We've already derived this. Remember, the p gradient of the Hamiltonian was velocity, right? Okay? So this is seeing it a second time the way it's normally presented. You gotta remember, this is an abnormal class, right? So I have to tell you when it's normal, when it's abnormal. <coughs> this is very normal and abnormal at the same time. Okay? Weird relations. These all are very strange and beautiful relations that need uh, talking. And then we also note that a partial derivative of P with respect to Q, that's understood, of course, to be identically zero. They're independent variables. Uh, certainly, uh, they're the, the canonical in the canonical, as I haven't defined that yet. Uh, at least outside of the Catholic Church. But anyway, uh, partial Q dot as velocity with respect to coordinate also identically zero. So uh, keep that in mind because there's velocity and momentum showing up in an action product. Okay, so the partial derivative of H with respect to Q, okay, if this is H, okay, well, I get double zero right here, and then finally the partial with respect to a Q the nth component of, of, of coordinate uh, L, okay? And uh, we already know what that is. That's the Q, uh, well, that, that's the uh, thing that's going to be giving us uh, Hamilton's second equation. And Hamilton's second equation, that's that one, has a minus sign, okay? Not quite as elegant as the Lagrangian pair, right? You got a minus sign. So we're gonna have to worry about that. That's making some anti-symmetry uh, come up uh, in, the, uh, discuss in the discussion here. So these are the two, and they're sitting on the wall over there, uh, pretty near each other, uh, near the top. Okay, But there's a third one, and that's this one. Okay, That's just as important 
uh, as uh, some of the uh, ones we've just uh, done there. This guy, okay, I want to emphasize that guy. That's weird. I mean, a most peculiar relation involving partial versus total. But what this is telling us is if the Lagrangian that you came up with and the one that you probably will work with most of the time for reasons that will be pretty evident as we go further here, if that Lagrangian uh, doesn't have um, uh, any uh, 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 explicit dependence of time, in other words, no mad scientist, okay, letting the, the system go, he's not mucking it up by turning some knobs, okay, if that has no explicit uh, uh, dependence on time, this thing is zero. H is a conserved quantity. This is your energy conservation. And eventually, the, and you'll see the Hamiltonian is the total energy. We'll derive that fairly shortly here for potential uh, 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 forces, conservative forces. Okay? It is possible. Uh, yeah. This guy m never stops. That's the heartbeat, the quantum heartbeat. You, you kill everything if you make that zero or, or constant. It's the, that's the dead system. This thing, energy constant, we love that, right? That's, that's not killing anything. That's having a, a dream or something, right? It's, everything's <coughs> not, not, not changing. Okay, so that's the mechanics course right there, as most people would say. We still have to do uh, Riemann equations, and we have to do um, the uh, uh, and um, the name has uh, slipped me uh, right now, uh, but we'll we'll run into that in the the which Christoffelson the Christoffelson is the Riemann uh, uh, equations, but there's the uh, I'll I'll think of them in a bit. Not important. But uh, there's still two more weird ways to say F equal MA. Okay, that's what we're, we're doing here. This is the Irish way to say F equal MA. Okay, basically there's your, your F right there. But we've got to do a little bit more to make that obvious. And then, of course, Lagrange is uh, uh, the first way. Uh, using generalized coordinates to say F equal MA. Okay, so... The thing we don't have here yet, because we came in the Lagrangian way, is a Hamiltonian that is obviously a function of covariant uh, momentum, an uh, explicit function. So that's what we have to do here. This is our Hamiltonian. We've got that. We know that it has this wonderful property that it might be a, a conserved quantity. The mad scientist will just leave his hands off the knobs. But the um, idea here, of course, is that um, Lagrangian itself, that's this thing right here, is an explicit function of velocity. So here we are faced with that uh, conundrum. That I see that velocity in the equations for these things. How do we get rid of it? Okay. And uh, we have uh, this definition here of momentum okay, that we already picked up when we talked about the Lagrangian. So here's the uh, metric uh, coefficient, uh, covariant metric, summing over all of the uh, coordinate velocities, all of the velocities, velocity component n being summed here, uh, to give me momentum component m. So this is the, uh, one of the jobs of these uh, covariant uh, uh, matrices or tensors. They're the metric tensor. This is called V metric tensor in uh, uh, general relativity. Uh, here, it is job is to turn a, a velocity into a momentum, turn a contravariant thing into a covariant thing. So it's doing that well. Uh, we have an extra coefficient here that you don't usually have in the relativistic things. That you think. That's all hidden uh, in the, a truly relativistic approximation or uh, theory, but. Uh, that's what we're going to use. Uh, we're going to uh, be uh, uh, manipulating uh, that sort of relation. So we're going to use uh, this thing. We've got um, this uh, Q dot right here. And then uh, what we're going to do is replace, this is the Lagrangian right here. That's this term right here. 
and then here's the uh, PM, that's this guy right here, okay? And so we're just going to put these two together because all this is is kinetic energy without the one half. This is the kinetic energy right here. So I end up here with this thing minus a half of that and that's where uh, this thing turns into what you have already probably memorized for the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics, which is the kinetic part plus the potential part. There it is. Okay. Now, of course, we're still in, in, in deep water, hot water, I should say, because this is only numerically correct. It is not differentially correct. That's that same uh, a problem. Okay, so we still have to fix this. Okay, but we got the metric to do that for us, and that's what we we we, we uh, uh, do. Okay, so is this uh, you know this is not trivial stuff. Okay, this is what we need. That's what we need to get. We need to uh, use the fact that the velocity is a contravariant. Uh, shall I say, index razor or knife razor. I'll give a contra now. I got my arm up with a knife. Okay, the G M N is converting this peaceful momentum guy, this covariant, into this contravariant guy, the a coordinate dot. Okay? So we need to replace this and this with this. And the details in the next page, but this is what uh, we do in order to make this thing both numerically and formally, that's differentially correct. Okay, so this still has to be done. Okay? We have to stick that guy in there and make that happen. Okay. Well, it isn't that tough. Okay? First of all, these metric things were a dot product of an EM and an EN, either sub or super, either one. Okay? So they're equal either way, and once that's true, then I don't have much trouble uh, converting this thing uh, to, and that's just a question of what to do with that, and that turns out to be uh, uh, a delta uh, function, okay? So we end up with this right here. There's the QN being written as, as a contravariant uh, ra raising operator, you might say, turning up a momentum into a velocity, a covariant thing into a contravariant thing. And then the metric inversion uh, symmetry uh, applies uh, uh, very nicely there. That's this thing. Okay? So we end up with something that looks like that. That's kind of messy looking, but uh, this one right here turns into what we uh, ask for. So there is the uh, Hamiltonian being written out in the formally and numerically correct uh, form. Now the polar uh, coordinate Lagrangian, <laughs> we've got to check all of this and see if we can get the results we got with the Lagrangian with this thing, which is, um, well, we already used this thing. What we have to do is use this thing uh, to see if we can get the same kind of relations. And this is where this whole thing sort of goes downhill because we discover to maybe your surprise is that this elegant uh, thing that, you, is, that you've used in quantum mechanics all along is not so elegant uh, when we have these things. Because you see, these things are the inverse of the original coefficients that went in front of the velocities. And whenever you do that, you usually make something that's more algebraically intractable. You've got something over the other case that's r squared and maybe a sine squared. But now you've got inverse r squared, and you've got inverse r squared sine squared as your coefficients. That kind of messes up the party, as you're going to see. It makes the algebra more complicated. So if you thought you were going to solve everything with Hamiltonian, no, it's not a Swiss Army knife. But uh, it's got its advantages that we're going to see later. Well, the first advantage I have to emphasize is that the Hamiltonian uh, if uh, we don't have any time, explicit time dependence, is conserved. Energy is conserved. So that's a, 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 good, a good thing. Okay. So let's look at those uh, 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 again, the metrics. Okay. This is the covariant one. 
where you took the partial derivative with respect to the vector uh, that's take the position vector uh, with, with respect to a, 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 a queer coordinate, a general, a GCC coordinate component m. And then you do n, okay? That's this vector right here, right? Now we're dealing with the uh, inverse, the Kajobian uh, components that have the queer coordinates in the numerator and we're doing a differentiation with respect to uh, r. Well, that's a gradient. And that's giving me this guy, which is, well, not that much more complicated for this simple polar coordinates, but it is 1 over r squared instead of r squared in the uh, second component of the metric. And this is a orthogonal <coughs> coordinate system. We're not seeing anything uh, off diagonal here. And of course, if you want to make the whole thing really simple, you'd be doing the Estrangian stuff, and you'd be doing this, and you'd be guaranteeing a 1 or a 0 every time you made a product like that. Okay. And you can see a basic idea is that this is a chain rule over Cartesian coordinates. This collapses into partial QN with respect to QM. And that's usually zero, only when it's the same coordinate and the par uh, a partial of a, of a coordinate with respect to itself is definitely one. So, and you, and you have to be very careful when you write the delta function just as well put G here, and it would be correct. But nobody does that whenever you have uh, the two indices uh, opposite sides. Uh, you could put the notation delta. Kronecker uh, is the mathematician that invented that notation. It's called a Kronecker delta, okay? All right. Uh, anything else that we need to uh, say here? Uh, everything making some sort of sense? Okay. But you see, we're getting at it from several points of view now. This is a standard algebraic approach to getting Hamiltonian out of a Lagrangian. And uh, the properties that uh, it has are going to fall uh, uh, pretty, pretty closely here. So here's our Hamiltonian we're going to be working with. And we'll be using RR and phi phi upstairs, the contravariant uh, matrix. Okay? And this one has to be 1, that one has to be 1 over r squared. So that's what we're dealing with. Okay? Instead of the nice Lagrangian that had this form here. Okay? So this is a good entry, this is a nice entry. It's the simplest uh, curved coordinate system, or the most familiar one anyway, not necessarily the simplest. We'll see some others that uh, are really quite beautiful. Uh, when we just complex variable part of this review, and that's the last uh, two lectures. It'll be coming up in a week or so. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else I need to say, uh, except to advance this thing to that point where we're really looking at uh, this. Now that the job is to uh, actually do that. Okay, let's see what Hamilton's actual equations. But you eventually have to just come out to the same thing with respect to coordinates and momentum as the Lagrangians, otherwise we've made a mistake somewhere. I also want to show that Hamilton's equation goes straight into a computer solution form. That could be nice, particularly since you're going to be using variables that are very uh, um, likely to be a part of a conserved system, a part of a Hamiltonian system. So, um, we've got Hamilton's first equation, we've got Hamilton's second equation. Let's go to work on this. Okay, the partial derivative of h with respect to p. Okay, if I look in there and uh, see uh, what uh, I would have a partial derivative of h with respect to pr. Okay, two cancels, one over m times pr. Okay, well it's no surprise that pr is what Lagrangian gave us, so that would uh, cancel out to give us r dot, and then uh, partial derivative of h with respect to pc would give us phi dot. Those are just uh, what we uh, would have gotten from our geometry. That's the p gradient of h. The velocity associated with that r, and the same thing here, the rate of change, time rate of change of the uh, angle phi that goes with this momentum. Angular momentum is what we're talking about there. The second equation, where you actually are, are, are worried about the, the uh, uh, coordinates, partial derivatives 
uh, here with respect to the Q's, and the Q's are the same as they were for the uh, Lagrangian, talking about R and phi. Okay, so when you do that one, according to the second equations, that's what you should get. Okay, well, uh, here we look at R dot and we say, oh, I knew what that is, that's PR over M, so there is one uh, result that checks out that that's uh, cool because this radius is essentially like a one-dimensional x. And then you look at the angular part and you see this one, okay, partial derivative of this with respect to things, p over m r squared. And the other thing to notice, of course, is that all the Hamiltonian stuff has inverse mass. It's another uh, a strike against it. Uh, if you're, you, you know, thinking in terms of what you like in sophomore physics. Okay, so here we've got p phi over this moment of inertia, uh, uh, rotational inertia uh, coefficient. And the same thing happens here as we go through and get a partial derivative of h with respect to r for real out of this thing. We'll eventually end up, if this thing is a, a radial dependent, we'll end up with that. So there's a a gradient that's giving us a force in the r uh, direction. Now this one has some twos canceled, but leaves me with sort of a ugly thing. P phi squared over m r cubed. Okay, that's uh, kind of weird, but okay, it's what it is. And the same thing uh, happens on the angle. With respect to the angle, since there are no phi's anywhere uh, in this thing except maybe in the potential, that's all you're going to get is the uh, phi derivative of the potential. All right, so, so far so good, okay? Now we come and make sure that, uh, uh, that these two uh, jive, and that just tells us PR equal MR dot. That's something we got pretty quickly with Lagrangian, but which only shows up now uh, in the Hamiltonian expression. And then that the angular momentum is equal to MR squared phi dot, it takes two steps to get that. That came out in one step with Lagrangian, you see. So I'm looking at this thing, you know, how much work do I have to do if I do Hamiltonian versus Lagrangian? Well, about twice as much. Okay, plus this thing is, is, is looking rather annoying. Okay, and you have to play with that for a while before you get that one uh, to jive. All right, so you use this one right here, just take a, t a total time derivative of that, put it next to this, and uh, go to work and you can solve that one to give you some of the stuff that we had before. This is the radial uh, change in momentum. And uh, this is just being dropped down. I haven't done any more of that. But I've got to do some more with this in order finally to get the Coriolis stuff. Okay? So this is not a winner. All right? Hamilton had too much beer in the Irish pub. Okay? But over in uh, France, it's fine wine. Okay, and everything works. First time. All right. That's the impression that you get from just looking at this very simple uh, uh, guy that we have here. Okay. So we go through all of this stuff and come up with what Lagrange gave us rather quickly uh, in the preceding lecture. All right. Okay. Well, that's kind of the way it is. There's the the stuff. Okay. But I do want to point out that if you organize these things uh, nicely, the runga kutta form, which is the fourth order runga kutta, is if you're going to solve differential equations with lots of variables and they aren't doing something nasty, uh, runga kutta, fourth order, uh, has, uh, you just plug these into a, a program that has the runga kutta integration, and you just use time derivatives that are functional coordinates. Time derivatives functional coordinates. You know, here we do the same thing, it's just we, we separate them depending on whether you're using momenta or, or phi. So this would this is the Hamilton, uh, basically the Hamilton equations coming out, and uh, you just plug this into a, a Rubicon integrator, and you get to use all the canonical variables, all the GCC variables. That's, that's kind of neat. Okay, now here's where Hamilton uh, shines. It shines with anything that has to do with conservation or symmetry. And we're going to consider first the isotropic harmonic oscillator, our, our sophomore physics inside the Earth potential. And uh, we're going to let the Hamiltonian 
uh, do something for us. First of all, as I've already said, that the Hamiltonian is the total energy. And if you know from some other way of knowing that the energy is constant, then this is a constant of motion, this whole thing right there. That's cool. Okay? And for quantum mechanics, you want to just be talking about a single frequency, because energy is frequency by Planck's rule, then this is your starting point uh, right there. Just a question, how are you going to express those things? We'll get to that. Now, um, the other thing is, and this is where the symmetry comes in, if you have cylindrical symmetry in the potential, that is, if uh, the Hamiltonian is such that uh, its explicit dependence on phi does not exist, that is, this is zero, and then p dot is minus zero, which is zero. Okay, so p dot uh, is absolutely unch unchanging. P phi will be a constant, usually indicated by either a j or an l or an m in, uh, say, atomic uh, physics. Okay? So what that allows you to do is turn a two-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional one. I only have to worry about the radius now. The angle can do whatever it wants, its angular momentum is going to be a constant, and I know the total here is, is constant, so I have a really simple one-dimensional uh, equation to solve now. So, a point for Hamilton, right? He, so that beer was a good beer. Okay? Yeah. So here we have to give L squared, right? But in quantum mechanics, we take L, L plus one. So what, what, why is the... Definitely setting this guy right here to a constant because p phi dot is zero. So you're basically just integrating p phi dot first derivative becomes a, an integration constant. Is that is that? Yeah, I, I was asking maybe here you have taken the L square, but in quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah. In uh, this particular guy right here. Uh, let's see if I've got uh, what you're pointing. I've got p phi squared here. So p phi is L, if that's what I call it. I will be dealing with an L squared uh, because of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Th this is what we're going to call the effective potential barrier. Centrifugal barrier, actually, is the name that's given to that little thing. We'll get to that in just a, a second here. But does that, and the algebra has to be answered. Does that make sense? Okay. This, this is really crucial. If that uh, thing has no phi dependence, we're guaranteed that this is a constant. Uh, okay. Any other questions like that? Does that make sense for you? And thank for questions, because whenever you ask a question, I bet you there was somebody else in the class that said, I'm going to, I don't know if I want to answer, ask that, that, that's too simple. So, don't be afraid to ask a question. There's no such thing as a stupid question. What's well, stupid is not asking a question. <laughs> and let the thing go on. You're scratching, not learning what's next afterwards, right? If you're worried about what that point was. Okay. So, let, let's um, go ahead and bring this guy up to speed here. Because we're going to have some animations that go with both of these. And try not to use the one down the road there. That's what we're after right there, at the very end of the uh, right there. Let's put it on this screen. So what we've got here is E equals, and then we've got PR squared. That's going to vary like mad, uh, supposedly. But this isn't, and this will vary, uh, depends on uh, uh, what it is, but it's only, it only going to work if there's no phi dependence in this. Well, already was no phi dependence in the kinetic part, but I want the potential to be smooth, okay, in the phi direction. I don't want any bumps, right? I should say I don't want any lumps in the potential around the angle. And with no lumps, there are no bumps. Bumps momentum change. Okay, that's a contemporary way to express what we've got here. But this thing here is called the centrifugal barrier. And we're going to show pictures of that in the animations. 
But this is called an effective potential, this whole thing here. It's only a function of R. What it's telling you is if you get close to the origin, this thing's going to get small, which makes this thing big. Right? And then you will do whatever it does uh, in addition to that one. That one's got a singularity at r equals zero. You cannot go to r equals zero without getting infinite uh, energy. Okay, so that's what we'll see when we do the animations, particularly for the Coulomb case. Right? But before we do that, let's finish the algebra and calculus. I can solve for the radial momentum, just in terms of algebraic uh, things here. Okay, I'm getting the uh, getting rid of the 2m, which cancels the 2 there, so I get an mkr squared. That's a uh, parabolic thing. I get an l squared over r squared. That's an inverse parabolic thing. And then I've got this constant here uh, to that. So I can turn that into an mr dot from the Hamilton's first equation of the radius we had before. And that means uh, that r dot, the velocity, in the radial direction is given by this, it's a function only of r, both r squared and inverse r squared. Okay? Both r squared and inverse r squared, and then I factored out square root of 2m. Okay? So that turns into uh, uh, what we call integer integration by quadrature. That's a fancy name for the fact that when you do it on a harmonic oscillator, you go quarter of the way, you go from the high point to the low point, that's a quarter of a circle. I think that's where it got its name. But anyway, this is allowing, allowing us to solve a first order differential equation involving just the variable r. So we end up here with a time that's an integral over, and we'll be talking about that in Unit 5, uh, the details of, of that as far as the inter, uh, calculus goes and all of that. So quarter cycle integration, usually from the lowest to the highest uh, a point uh, of, of some object uh, is given the name uh, integration by quadrature. And that's giving you the time that uh, it took to get to us uh, from a low point to a high point. Or uh, if you've changed the uh, limits uh, from any point to any other point uh, in principle. Okay, so um, we have all of that. Now what we're going to look at is the uh, in the one the uh, sophomore in physics inside of the Earth uh, part of this that is uh, Hamiltonian dynamics for the isotropic harmonic oscillator. Okay, this potential k r squared over two. That's this parabola right here. And now added to it, and, and added to it depends. You see on how much L squared I'm allowed to have. If L squared is zero, well then I just do the old thing with a parabola. I just have this parabola and my momentum. I'm doing a simple oscillator uh, mechanics. I'm not having to do integrations between various weird points on some screwy curve that has this stuff added to the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so uh, what we're looking for um, are stability points. That's an orbit. Okay, that's a, the, the kind of uh, thinking that goes with all of this effective potential uh, stuff. Now, most of you guys, or I think all of you guys, have gone through the qualifying exam of the old, either gone through the old one or don't have to go through the old one because we changed the policy, right? But this is the thing that you get thrown on every one of them. Every one of them's got one of these on it. So you, if you're ca cautioning other people at other schools that still have to take qualifying exams, tell them, hey, here's what you got to know to easily do uh, qualifying exams, at least uh, for, uh, a good part of them. Anyway, uh, the thing about the geometry of this thing is, is weird, because here we've smashed the thing with a single radius, but it's still going around in two dimensions, x and y. Both r and phi are changing, perhaps uh, very abruptly, uh, in these things. So one of the things you have to do is find the limits 
you see the apogee, which means you're the furthest up, up, up apogee, it should be called, and then the perigee, okay, uh, para means down, I guess, but this is the low point, but it's the upper point for the uh, uh, speed. You, you loiter up past this point and then zoom past this point, right? Like the Kepler stuff that we saw uh, uh, animated before. Well, we're going to see that uh, uh, again here. Okay. Now, before we show animations and compare them, let me uh, jump ahead uh, on this one right here, this uh, thing, uh, uh, to the Coulomb. Okay. Now, uh, what you're talking about is uh, 1 over R. That's the real potential energy right there. Minus 1 over R, or the, 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 this isn't going to orbit at all. I need an attractive Coulomb uh, potential here. And, and uh, that one needs to not be a negative R squared, or it's going to be unbounded. We're talking about bound solutions here. And then here's this darn M squared in the denominator, MR squared in the denominator. The barrier, okay, centrifugal barrier, it's a barrier because it climbs up around the uh, origin. All right, so that's going to make some really crazy, uh, dippy sort of, uh, uh, of of effective potentials. This this stuff here in pink is the effective potential that this uh, uh, Coulomb a uh, problem has. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, go ahead and uh, animate a, a, a couple of things. This one right here will be an animation of the uh, Coulomb. But before we do that, I want to go over and see if I can get that one going. That's an easier one to control. There we go. Okay, now there's a couple of things plotted on here. This one is giving PY versus PX. And I think you already know that that guy there should be a copy of this one, at least somehow, right? So we've already looked at the details of the coordinations and velocities and minims and jerks and, uh, uh, you know, up through the fourth derivative, which is just the uh, original position for an oscillator. Okay? Now I should point out uh, when you play with this uh, this thing, uh, there's a lot of, of freedom here. Um, what you can do is first of all uh, pick your initial point anywhere on here, hold the button, and then change the velocity. And eventually we'll put a little arrow that goes from the a red dot to the arrow, so that would be indicating your your initial velocity. So if I, uh, for example, put it down here so that I get something that's going uh, clockwise like that, and depending on how far down there I went, how big an ellipse I get. So this is perfectly capable, you see, of drawing an ellipse that is in any orientation. That means it's perfectly capable of getting any uh, sort of uh, orbit that's possible inside the sophomore physics Earth in a two-dimensional isotropic oscillator. That's a U2 symmetric object. Just to use the mathematical terms to go with it. And then uh, you can actually reach down uh, into the uh, potential space here and pick another point near there and you see what it's doing. Very slowly bouncing off of that going fast through that change and then coming back to the perigee. Okay? I'm sorry, the apogee. This is the up, the apogee right there. There's an apogee. Then I come through that perigee and then I come back to the other apogee on this one. And then back to the second perigee and then we're off where we started. Okay? So that gives you an idea of uh, uh, what that is. And while this one is reaching the apogee, that one's reaching, the momentum is reaching a, a uh, apogee. There's perigee, apogee. Now it's going through its perigee, that one's going through its apogee. 
So there's that phase relation to uh, be aware of, which we're already very familiar with, because these are just sines and cosines, right? This one's a little screwier, okay? So let's take a look at it, and then uh, we're pretty much done for the day after we've played with this uh, and a few other little things that connect with it. But let's uh, go ahead and do it, see if it'll work over here. Click, we go over, and I've got it on the right website, so uh, we're off to the races. We're at the apogee here, and bang, we pass the perigee. There's only one of each. And then it's get back to the apogee again. There's only one apogee and only one perigee. Bang, okay? And the uh, other thing uh, here that's worth noting, and I don't know, do you see anything here that's worth noting besides what we've just noticed? They're sort of like going on a circle, like a particle going on a circle. This is crazy, right? That thing over there, you know, just makes ellipses to match that one, right? This one always makes a circle. This is, you know, you can go through a lot of mechanics books and they won't show you that. Now we do all our stuff are really comfortable, so we discovered this pretty early. I wrote an American Journal of Physics article on it uh, with a class again. And, um, but you see, it's going very slowly uh, through the thing because it's way up here. Let's make this thing uh, more extreme uh, so that this becomes more obvious. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll start it right here, way out at the end. Just give it a, let's go uh, clockwise again. Okay, you see, as I, as I change that, uh, right now, uh, I've got it right on the uh, piece there. There we go. Okay, so there's my apogee right there, and it's, you know, practically flat there, so I'm, I'm going pretty slowly. But here comes the ellipse, right? Wham! Right? This shows you how cool, I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty crazy. Now, uh, what I'm seeing here is, I think the energy changed. But let's let her run again and see uh, what happens here. It obviously changed from the position that I... I sure, you, you, you <coughs> can put a new value. Yeah. Uh, to check that energy. That's minus 0. 0.434. Let's see how she goes. Okay, she's at the top. Ah, I see. Okay. And this point is just barely moving on this circle, right? This is a big circle, right? And it's the other way because I made it uh, clock clockwise. Here she comes. Here she comes. Let's see if it can get to, through the barrier uh, without losing energy. Okay, we're talking about four, three, four. That's supposed to be an absolute constant. Bang! And it's not. Okay, we got some work doing our. Uh, we have an adaptive step size on this thing. You but just it's a, stick an extra zero in there, and it'll be exact. Yeah, right. And you change yeah. your step size. It's clearly, it's clearly climbing up out of the barrier. Okay, so th this is an extreme example, um, but uh, I can give you it a less extreme it. one. And um, by the way, when you get done here, race paths, uh, you, you can start afresh. And this one is also going to be clockwise. And it should make a circle, and it does. And it looks like it's going to return. I didn't check the energy. I did. It wasn't checked. It hasn't at least changed. Not three three figures. Figures. So here, here is, and the circle isn't always centered. You see, it's got to match the orientation. And when we do the geometrical construction of Coulomb orbits, you'll, this will be obvious from that. But. Um, the, 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 I think it's just beautiful that, that the momentum makes a circle. Okay, that, 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 that's a, a really stunning uh, observation of this uh, stuff. I think. Okay, um, I'll, uh, you know, let you play with these uh, guys on the web. And the, and the question is, now that she's got her new machine, whether you can play this game uh, with these. Uh, probably when you click on that thing, you'll get something orbiting, 
But uh, the question is, can you control it? Uh, oh, I can speak to that. Um, have you tried it? No, I programmed it. Oh, you, you've got something the in there. The back end. It accepts clicks, okay. but no moves or I drags. I can't see is anything. So that some of the gestures are missing as of now. However, the numeric values, when they are in place, you'll be able to enter. Now, here is a caveat, and I mentioned this to Professor Harder before coming in. This is a late-breaking app, and the scenario-specific controls are not in place yet. Yeah. You can't change the mass of this. Oh, the, this stuff. In the control panel. Yeah. Show that will controls. be in place here in the next couple days, probably before next Tuesday. Okay, good. So just bear with me on that. So TC's got some uh, homework, just like you do, and then one of them is to get this guy uh, working uh, so that you can actually change the variables uh, to try uh, different cases that uh, are of numerical interest. Okay, um, let me back out of this one, and it seems to be holding its energy, so that's a good sign for that. Um, let's go ahead here and uh, see if there's anything else. I want to remind you that this connects with what we did before. Uh, to remind you what that is, to remember the three steps from hell. <laughs> right? You're at the bottom here, you go up a certain amount of energy, right? And get to stand at the surface of the earth instead of boiling in hell. <laughs> the center of the earth, you know, boy, that was a tough trip, right? But you're still not moving, right? So you go another step by just simply getting enough kinetic energy tangential to the Earth to be in a circular orbit at that radius, right? And it doesn't change, okay? But you, you, you consider the whole Earth to be hell. You want to get the hell out of here. You've got another step here, right, to go to infinity. That's your escape. Okay, you do completely escape exactly that. You get a little more than your escape plus some. Okay, so that's what's uh, uh, present uh, under the uh, scene here. Uh, there's when you crush the earth, that's what we did before. But th there is the same effect. Here's a, an effective potential uh, that's going uh, for that uh, particular thing, the or uh, circular orbit. Okay, and you're at the bottom of it. And that means that if I come over here and click uh, probably about there, maybe a little closer like there, it wasn't quite there. You can see that it's oscillating a little bit, and that's not quite a circle, but it's about you can see on the to, it, to within about six pixels, it's uh, at the equilibrium uh, point. But it's pretty tough to find that just by eye, right? It's fun to play the game, right? And that's with the oscillator. With the cool ohm, right, there are a whole bunch of these. Okay? And that's uh, what makes the cool ohm more interesting. So in Unit 5, we will be taking these two problems, the oscillator and the cool ohm, and step by step throughout the algebra, you see this beautiful symmetry between the two. And um, I don't know what that means yet, but it's it's worth seeing it just to you know take the make it a, make what is usually a considered a, dope, a boring exercise into something that's uh, uh, interesting. Okay, we're going to uh, quit right there, but I do want to point out we've got some other simulations that we'll do uh, next time that have to do with what I call catcher in the eye. It's, Treating a face space as a hurricane, and you can do things inside there. There's also an application called Jerkit and Cyclodium and Pendulum, where we look at the some interesting pieces of that. So that will be Hamiltonian mechanics in a um, different setting, uh, as it were. Okay, so we'll uh, go ahead and do a little early today because if, if I uh, add this stuff, I have to rush through it, and I don't want to rush through it, stuff like that. It's very pretty. Okay?